I remember the first jazz album I bought really well. It was um, Miles Davis's Live Evil. And then I remember the next two I bought after that. The next one was John Coltrane's Sonship, and the one after that was Ornette Coleman's Science Fiction. I still have all three of those LPs, incidentally. You know, I when I moved um, when I moved some of my stuff down to Miami, uh, you know, I brought a bunch of my LPs and my record player into my office. I thought it would be a good idea to um, to you know show some of my students the old school. So, uh, young man walks into my office, a trumpet student, and he looks in the bookshelf and he says, "Why are those books all so long and thin?" And you think this would be a joke, but it's not, you know. So that's that's the relationship we have to the LP now nowadays. Anyhow, those were the first three. I was a tremendous avant-garde music devotee. I think I had something like maybe 25 Sun Ra albums, um, Art Ensemble Chicago, Don Cherry. You know, all the there there is this whole series of of records that um, you know I used to haunt the the cutout bins. And so there was this whole series of records that a French label put out of all the free jazz musicians. You might, you might remember, I think it was called the BYG or the Big Actuel series. So I had, had a complete collection of those. So, you, you know, there's, there's nothing you can't ask me about, you know, Jacques Courcil, you know, the great trumpet player from Martinique or, you know, any of these very kind of maybe somewhat obscure free jazz musicians that I've been, you know. Ironically enough, since I've... I've sort of been associated and, and gravitated in the end to a lot of very different kinds of music you know, from, you know, from that point in, in my young, young life at that point. But I, I still retain a great amount of affection and love for that, that kind of music. Yes, I do. I, I, rem I mean, I remember the you know the, the guys were playing in town and stuff like that, so I would go to the clubs. I remember the first time I sat in, what tune it was. It was Maiden Voyage. I got lost with four chords, but but you know I see that today. It's it's actually the le the fewer chords, the, the easier it is to get lost sometimes. But um, but um, in terms of the first concert I saw from by a New York group that came through town was Elvin Jones's quartet with Steve Grossman and Dave Liebman and Gene Perla. And I think this was maybe about a couple weeks before they cut uh, Elvin Jones live at the Lighthouse. I remember very well that uh, the tremendous impact of seeing Keiko Jones nail the drums to the stage and before Elvin came. This was an outdoor concert. On a, on, a, on a you know like a like a improvised sort of stage, and then sit down sit down next to me on the grass and and and, and you know within the crowd and listen to the concert. Tremendous impact in in terms of the of the way those guys played, and you know of course that's you know Elvin Jones live at the Lighthouse is a pretty revered like like disc in terms of the evolution of I think you know a certain era of jazz and a certain kind of style of improvisation. It's a textbook. You know, and and to see the contrast between the way Steve Grossman and, and, and Lieb played, and you know the whole, and you know tremendous hypnosis factor of it all, just you know, forget it. it was all over. You know. I think it's so vitally important to have the sense of that you could make it possible to make your living playing music from the earliest age possible. So in my case, even through high school, I was going out on, on these gigs with these rock bands and, you know, and, and the, you know, the funny thing, we would, re you know, you'd rehearse for about six months, you know, to get about three or four tunes down because, you know, of course, nobody knew how to, you know, do anything, you know. You know, like take, you know, taking music off our records and stuff was, was a highly imperfect art back when you were 14 or 15. But, um, um, you know, I think, I, I remember a lot of things, I remember a lot of things. I think when I, when I got in school, when I got in music school, then maybe that was around the time I started to actually start making steady money playing. And I was lucky, I was, it, I was in a, in a place where there were, weren't that many trumpet players and somehow I was able to get on the jazz scene and actually, you know, you know play, a good deal, like three or four nights a week. Um, 
the first gig, I, can't, I couldn't really tell. I couldn't really tell you. It was probably playing for $3 in a, in a CYO basement somewhere when I was about 14, playing, you know, waiting for the, the big, by big, um, big chance to play the, the um, solo on uh, Color My World or something like that. Or Herb Alpert, maybe. Yeah. Well, no, well that was... Oh, 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 oh sorry. That we're going back even further now. Um, I, mean, I mean, in terms of influences, um, you know, I think, my, I think my desire to perform goes back to um, the first little group we had together. This was sixth grade for the talent show. And they had the most, most interesting instrumentation of trumpet, alto horn and drums and so we attempted to play the um, Herb Alpert repertoire with that combination. We, we made up for lack of orchestration with our enthusiasm and but not completely made up for the all the bad notes that we were playing. That's a fabulous story. <laughs> there you go, yeah. <laughs> So well, it's all about that whipped cream color. <laughs> I know, it's a whipped cream color. I was wondering when you were going to bring that It's up. all about that. Like an adolescent boy seeing that thing. It's like, all I'm about sure it. even the dads were like, oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah. where did my cover go? <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. <you> know. <laughs> Brian Lynch.